to more than I had expected. Liza Mundy has been our guest for the last 45 minutes here on the Washington Journal, talking about her cover story in Time Magazine, The Richer Sex. Her book is out today. It's also called The Richer Sex. Watch for her on Book TV in the near future. Liza Mundy of the Washington Post. The House is now in session. The House, a communication from the Speaker. The Speaker's Rooms, Washington, D.C., March 21st, 2012. I hereby appoint the Honorable Brene L. Elmers to act as Speaker Pro Tempore on this day. Signed, John A. Boehner, Speaker of the House of Representatives. Pursuant to the orders of the House January 17, 2012, the Chair will now recognize members from lists submitted by the majority and minority leaders for morning hour debate. The Chair will alternate recognition between the parties, with each party limited to one hour and each member other than the majority or, and minority leaders and the minority whip limited to five minutes each. But in no event shall debate continue beyond 11.50 a.m. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For many, tomorrow is just an ordinary Thursday like any other day. But for hundreds of millions of people who lack access to clean water and billions who lack access to adequate sanitation. This ordinary Thursday is part of a daily struggle. But this Thursday is World Water Day, where those of us fortunate enough to live in developed countries are encouraged to reflect on just how fundamental fresh water is to our health, our children's well-being, and how much we take for granted. We've never had to try to work that hard to find drinking water. We don't have to choose between drinking dirty water and going thirsty. For many of us, fresh water is so safe, abundant, it's hard to even imagine life without it. But on this World Water Day, we should reflect that every 20 seconds, a child dies needlessly from waterborne disease. Today and every day, women will spend two hundred million hours collecting water. This week, three million students will miss school because they lack access to clean water or sanitation. Indeed, half the people who are sick around the world today are sick needlessly from waterborne disease. There is a vision, there is a knowledge to do something about it. But sadly, we don't have the resources and we actually don't have the plan. The United States is not only having an obligation, I think, to do the right thing and save lives, but it's also in our self-interest to provide access to safe water. United States security experts testified before this Congress that water problems will contribute to the instability in states important to the United States national security interests. With all the problems the world faces, Congress needs to prioritize programs that deliver the highest return on investment with substantial multiplier effects. And when it comes to foreign assistance, increasing access to clean water is the most effective use of taxpayer dollars. The World Health Organization estimates that up to $34 is saved for every dollar invested saved from health care costs and resulting in increased economic productivity. Indeed, it affects other efforts of our aid. We're involved with trying to eradicate diseases like HIV AIDS and tuberculosis. But taking the medicine with dirty water compounds the problems and, uh, in terms of diarrheal diseases that result from that dirty water. Madam Speaker, since we passed the Water for the World legislation seven years ago, where Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Henry Hyde, Senator Reid, and Senator Frist were my partners, we've increased our leadership globally. We owe a debt of gratitude to Secretary Clinton, who has made water a cornerstone of her work while at the helm of the State Department. But 
we do need to do more. And one simple step, an area where we find broad bipartisan support, is the Water for the World Act that is co-sponsored with my friend and colleague from Texas, Mr. Poe. This legislation strengthens the capacity of USAID and the State Department, increases aid effectiveness, transparency, accountability for sanitation, water, and hygiene. And it has no net cost, according to the CBO. I strongly urge my colleagues to co-sponsor this legislation and hope that we can move it forward in this Congress as there has been movement in the Senate. Millions of lives will be transformed. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Roz Lightning, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I would like to uh, begin my remarks by commending all of the citizens and young students in my congressional district and indeed throughout the country who have worked so hard to raise awareness about Joseph Coney and his brutal crimes. As we can see in this poster, there's Coney, and these are just a few of the photos of uh, of so many uh, innocents uh, who have been uh, mutilated by uh, Coney and his thugs. Joseph Coney is a mass murderer whose campaign of violence against innocent civilians spans decades. The predatory forces doing his bidding is known as the Lord's Resistance Army, or LRA, and they have perpetrated some of the worst human rights abuses of our time. Under the direction of Coney, the LRA has murdered, raped, mutilated and abducted tens of thousands of innocent people, many of whom are children. They target remote villages, butchering civilians, abducting women and children to serve as sex slaves and fighters. Kony's bloody reach now extends to the, D the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Central African Republic, and the newly, re newly formed Republic of South Sudan. One measure that we could accomplish would be for the UN peacekeeping missions in the region to more effectively coordinate their actions, share information related to Kony and the N LRA, because this is a threat that crosses many international borders. I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, Congressman Ed Royce, for introducing a new bill, H.R. 4077, which I proudly support. Uh, H.R. 4077 would uh, authorize the Secretary of State to use the State Department's rewards program to gain intelligence and strengthen the capacity of those who are actively engaged in fighting transnational organized crime and also apply it to the search for Coney and the LRA. This program has served as a valuable incentive for those with crucial information to come forward and help round up foreign nationals wanted for a range of brutal crimes and activities that threaten regional and global security and stability and U.S. national security interests. It would be an important tool in helping bring Coney and his cir circle of thugs, the Lord's Resistance Army, to justice. I'd also like to thank Congressman uh, Jim McGovern for uh, introducing House Resolution 583, of which I am also a proud co-sponsor. Uh, Mr. McGovern's resolution echoes current law and puts the House on record in strong support of U.S. efforts to counter the Lord's Resistance Army. It urges the President to work closely with Congress to address critical gaps in U.S. strategy and to enhance U.S. support for the regional measures already there to fight the Lord's Resistance Army. As we have seen over the past 25 years, Coney's assault on innocence on innocent lives has no limits. Now is the time to help bring Joseph Coney and his fellow criminals to justice. As a nation, let us assure that we have done all that we can to end this ongoing tragedy and hold this evil man accountable for all of his crimes. I thank all of the young people throughout my district who have communicated through Twitter and Facebook and different modes of social media to express their outrage over Coney's evil deeds, but now let's take action. Let's pass these bills. I thank the speaker for the time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Gutierrez, for five minutes.
Last Thursday, a different kind of March Madness took place in the NCAA basketball tournament. In a game between Kansas State and Mississippi State, Angel Rodriguez, a Puerto Rican point guard for Kansas State, was met with taunts from Mississippi State students while he was getting ready to shoot a free throw. The taunt, where's your green card? That's not the only March Madness. Earlier this month in San Antonio, Texas, fans of Alamo Heights, a predominantly white high school in San Antonio, chanted their regional basketball championship trophy presentation. Their chant was, USA, USA. Why did they chant USA? Because their team had defeated San Antonio's Thomas Edison High School, a team of mostly Latino players. One U.S. citizen asked to produce his green card. One entire team of Americans taunted as if they were foreigners. These young people, subjected to hatred, bigotry, handled it well. Angel Rodriguez ignored the taunts and played a great game. If he hadn't been busy helping Kansas State win the game, he might have mentioned to everybody that he was from Miami or that all Puerto Ricans are citizens of the United States. I'm impressed that the kids from Thomas Edison High School kept their cool. They deserve our praise not only for being good basketball players, but just for being great kids. Mississippi State and Alamo Heights have apologized for the taunts. That's an important step in the right direction. But that's not the issue. The issue is why people think it's okay to treat Latinos as if they were second-rate Americans. Why so many people seem to think that being Latino means being a suspect in our own country. Why they look at a young man named Rodriguez and think he doesn't belong in this country. Because misguided kids taunting Latinos isn't really the disease. You see, it's just a symptom. The heart of the sickness is more troubling. The truth is, when it comes to Latinos and immigrants, far too many so-called leaders in our nation are starting the taunts. On the campaign trail and on talk radio and on TV and even here in this chamber, there are leaders that act like the biggest bullies in the schoolyard. If elected officials have no boundaries when it comes to scapegoating and demonizing immigrants and Latinos, why should young people at a basketball game know any better. Why does a, an American, a Puerto Rican citizen basketball player, get taunted about a green card? It's easier to understand when you hear the front runner for Republican nomination for president promoting a national immigration policy that makes all Latinos look like suspects and all immigrants look like criminals. Mitt Romney has said that the Arizona anti-immigrant law, a law that essentially demands racial profiling of anyone who looks like they might be undocumented, is a model for our nation. But that's not all Mitt Romney has said to American Latinos. He has said that all 11 million immigrants, most of them Latinos, should self-deport, even if they've lived here since they were children and have American citizen children families. He's even gone as far, Mitt Romney, to attack the first Latino Supreme Court justice. He believes that Justice Sotomayor is unqualified to serve on the Supreme Court. He's proud of the support of anti-immigrant extremists, including the author of Arizona's anti-immigrant law. He's attacked the DREAM Act, a perfectly reasonable bill. And Mitt Romney's hardly a lone voice. It's sad. One member of this House said he would be for any measure to stop illegal immigrants, quote, short of shooting them, maybe hanging them, gassing them. One other colleague called undocumented immigrants, a colleague of ours here, a slow rolling, slow motion terrorist attack on the United States. Bat Buchanan wrote a book entitled State of the Emergency, the Third World Invasion and Conquest of America. Folks like Buchanan and Limbaugh regularly use words like hordes and swarms to describe immigrants. Maybe Mitt Romney thinks he's just saying what he needs to say to get the Republican nomination. And maybe some elected officials think their extreme rhetoric doesn't really carry outside the halls of Congress. But you know what? America knows better. And so does a group of Kansas State basketball player and a group of good kids from San Antonio, Texas. They know that words matter very much. And here's my advice to the Romneys and the Buchanans of the world and a few of my colleagues here in the House. Instead of bullies, why don't you be leaders? And why don't you try some words that bring people together instead of insults that tears our nation apart? The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
This Friday, March 23rd, marks the second anniversary of President Obama's health care law. After two years, it's clear the law has already left more victims in its path than people it was meant to help. And unfortunately, along with the 20 million employees who will probably lose employer-sponsored health care, it may be our seniors who take the hardest hit. Millions of senior, seniors and disabled Americans rely on Medicare, yet the program is in danger. According to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, with the baby boomer generation about to retire, if nothing is done to the program, the program will be bankrupt in 10 years. Instead of making Medicare stronger through transparent and responsible reform, the President has decided to cut more than $500 billion from the program, money which then will then be used to fund his new health care law. If taking nearly half a trillion dollars from the already crippled program wasn't bad enough, the President has handpicked a special panel to slash away at the program even more. He knows our country is facing a budget shortfall. But instead of implementing responsible and transparent reforms, the President wants to take away benefits from Medicare recipients to fund his agenda for new entitlements. The panel known as the Independent Payment Advisory Board, or IPAB, is a group of unelected and unaccountable bureaucrats who will essentially be given power to ration care and even deny seniors life-saving treatments. Its members are not required to hold public hearings or disclose their meetings. Their salaries will be paid directly out of trust funds used to pay Medicare beneficiaries health care claims. Worse yet, doctors and patients cannot challenge the IPAB's decision in court. Without a three-fifths majority in both chambers, Congress has no power to change decisions. And while this select group rakes in the perks, it will be the seniors left holding the short end of the stick. The health care law, and IPAB in particular, will threaten their access to quality care. Medicare is already known for its low reimbursement rates. Physicians receive about 20 percent less from Medicare than private health plans, forcing many to stop accepting patients just to stay in business. Seniors will be left with fewer options and they may even be told they can no longer see their own doctor. That's why when I talk to seniors in my district, they're scared of this law. They're worried about being left with fewer options. They're worried about not being able to see their own doctor. And they're worried about the government setting even, cutting even more from the program. It's not just my district where this concern is prevalent. According to a recent nationwide poll, 60% of our nation's seniors have an unfavorable view of the law. Access to quality care for seniors should be a top priority and will remain so with me. I believe health care decisions should be made by patients, families, and their doctors, not by bureaucrats in Washington who are burdening seniors and future generations with less choice, fewer services, and more debt. House Republicans remain committed to strengthening and reforming Medicare to protect today's seniors and make sure the program is still there for the next generation. And I yield back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the Congress, Monica Pearson with WSB Television in Atlanta, Georgia, is indeed a true pioneer and a trailblazer in television news. She broke barriers as an African American and as a woman, as a news anchor for WSB Television starting in 1975. 1975 was an important year and turning point, especially in the South. So it is very important for us to understand the significance of Monica Kaufman appearing as a nightly anchor, as the first African American and first woman in the South at WSB television in 1975. And now, 30 Eight years later, Monica is retiring. 
Monica Pearson brought uh, a special talent, a sparkling personality, hard work, and a high nobility of purpose that appealed to everybody, to people of all races. And she became endeared to everybody from every walk of life. What a great American story is Monica Pearson. She paved the way for other African Americans and women to become news anchors and to become television journalists throughout the South. And so it is most fitting that we gather here today as she announces her retirement on a part of the United States Congress to give her this special commendation. And also we give a special commendation to WSB Television and the Cox Enterprises Management for making that critical decision at that important time in the history of the United States. And so because of her talent, because of her hard work, we in the Congress of the United States recognize with high distinction Monica Pearson, an outstanding American. And Madam Speaker, I'd like to submit my longer statement for the record. Without objection, as ordered. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Gingry, for five minutes. Madam Speaker, thank you very much. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, you will notice that members from Georgia on both sides of the aisle have taken the opportunity uh, this morning uh, during special order time to, to recognize Monica Kaufman. We just heard from uh, our colleague, uh, Representative David Scott. Uh, I want to commend uh, my friend David Scott for organizing this tribute on behalf of one great lady. And I rise today as well to recognize Monica Kaufman for her historic and outstanding achievements in broadcast journalism. Atlanta is sad to see her retire from WSB and Cox Broadcasting, but we are very, very proud of her legacy. For the past 37 years, she has brought Atlanta the news from her coverage of the 1996 Olympics to her famous Monica Kaufman close-ups of world leaders and celebrities, to her award-winning work on issues such as the Holocaust and domestic abuse. As the first woman and African-American news anchor in Atlanta, Ms. Kaufman broke both race and gender barriers. She has won more than 30 local and Southern Regional Emmy Awards for her talent, for her reporting, and those close-up interviews. Ms. Kaufman has also been named University of Georgia's Broadcaster of the Year in 2001 and the Georgia Association of Broadcasters' 1992 Citizen Broadcaster of the Year. Madam Speaker, I will always remember, however, one evening, uh, July the, well gosh, I guess it was uh, uh, 2002, uh, it, it was actually November of 2002, uh, when I was first running for Congress. Uh, and that election night, in a very, very close race, it went deep into the night, and finally about 11 o'clock, it was news time uh, at WSB, and sure enough, I had to go downstairs and get ready to be interviewed by Monica Kaufman in regard to my race for Congress. Uh, and at that point, uh, we were behind. Uh, all counties except one had reported, uh, and I was behind. And Monica was very sweet and kind to me. Uh, she could tell that I was a little nervous and worried and scared. And she said, you know, have you picked up the phone yet to call your opponent to congratulate him on his victory. And I said, Monica, I haven't. I'm not going to do that until the last vote is counted. And then shortly after hanging up the phone and being off the air, I get a call from my opponent telling me congratulations. Indeed, those final uh, precincts came in, and Dr. Gingry, Dr. Phil, 
was the new member from the 11th Congressional District of Georgia. I'll always remember Monica Kaufman very fondly from that night. Madam Speaker, I ask my colleagues to join me in recognizing the contributions and accomplishments of this great community leader, Monica Kaufman Pearson. And I yield back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Bishop, for five minutes. Request permission to revise and extend that remark. Without objection. Madam Speaker, I am honored to join my colleagues from the Georgia delegation uh, in paying tribute to one of our nation's most tenured and preeminent broadcast television news anchors, Monica Kaufman Pearson. For more than 30 years, she served as the Channel 2 Action News Nightbeat anchor at WSB-TV in Atlanta, where she used her superior media talents to educate, inform, and enlighten millions of viewers about current events that impacted our lives and influenced activities all around the world. Prior to becoming one of Atlanta's most watched and influential television journalists, Monica worked as a reporter at the Louisville Times and WHAS-TV in Kentucky. Madam Speaker, Monica Pearson is an award-winning journalist who has been recognized on numerous occasions for her outstanding professional abilities and remarkable occupational achievements. However, she is much more than just an accomplished journalist. She is a loving wife, mother, mentor, friend, and role model to many. Madam Speaker, my wife Vivian and I would like to extend our personal congratulations to Monica Pearson and to her family as they celebrate and reflect upon her outstanding career as one of our nation's leading broadcast journalists and admired media personalities. Kentucky may have named her, but Georgia claimed her, and we are all better because she came our way. Congratulations to you, Monica Kaufman Pearson. The, cha the chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Westmoreland, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I come to the floor uh, this morning with great sadness, but with also great honor uh, to, to honor the service of one of Georgia's own, Captain Nicholas Whitlock. On February the 18th, 2012, at Camp Lemonya in Djibouti, Africa, he gave the ultimate sacrifice while returning from a mission in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. Captain Whitlock was born to the proud parents of Jimmy and Claire Whitlock on December the 10th, 1982. Even at a young age, Nick showed the maturity, that he was full of integrity, and even in high school, during one of his assignments, he was given, he was asked what he would describe a leader as. He wrote, a leader is a person that is in charge of a group, someone that everyone looks up to and wants to be like. A leader is also someone that is willing to complete their goals and give 100 percent no matter what. A leader is willing to stand up for what he believes in even if he is alone. I want to be a leader because I think that is what God has called me to be. And for all the young people that uh, Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker that might be watching, we're always looking for a hero. And uh, I think many of our young people can look, especially after listening to some of the things that uh, Nick did with his life, that he's a hero. Nick lived on his own words, and to say he was a leader is an understatement. He understood that success is achieved through hard work, faith, and dedication and lived every day as an opportunity in, to improve himself and the lives of others. Nick graduated from Noonan High School in 2001 as an honor graduate and was uh, recognized for his outstanding achievements in both football 
in baseball. Nick achieved uh, his Eagle Scout uh, rank and strove to use the skills uh, he learned to influence every aspect of his life. He attended Mercer University and uh, caught for the Mercer Bears baseball team. Most notable Nick's many campus activities were his leadership roles as Mercer Ambassador, President of his fraternity Sigma Alpha Epsilon, and Senator at Large for the Student Government Association. In 2005, Nick graduated with a Bachelor of Business Administration degree, and in 2011, he went on to earn his master's degree in business administration from the University of Florida. While studying at Mercer, Nick earned his private pilot's license and was accepted into the United States Air Force in 2006. Nick trained with the uh, Euro-NATO uh, Joint Jet Pilot Training Program. 2008, he received his wings and was assigned to the Air Force Special Operations. He became a member of the 34th Special Operations Squadron, which we've all heard about in the paper and uh, news, and was promoted to captain in November of 2010, where he was assigned to the U-28A aircraft. November proved to be one to celebrate as Nick married the love of his life, Ashley, the same month as his promotion. Nick spread the happiness uh, he found in both his marriage and life through his involvement with organizations such as Alaska's Healing Hearts, a nonprofit organization enabling disabled military veterans to participate in outdoor activities. Nick was serving on his fifth deployment in Djibouti, Africa, when an accident occurred while his aircraft was returning from a mission, taking not only his life, but three of his fellow comrades. Nick was laid to rest at Forest Lawn Cemetery in his hometown of Noonan, Georgia, following a heartfelt ceremony at First Baptist Church. Friends of Nick say he made them proud to be an American and to want to become a better man of God and a better father, a better husband, a better son. And his wife, Ashley, described Nick's loving, thoughtful, honest, considerate, and generous. He was a true gentleman and a steadfast man of God. They both prayed for God to shape their lives for his purpose so that their blessings would not stop with them but extend to everyone he met. His parents' love and pride for Nick, unwavering faith, integrity, and intelligence is never-ending. They talked often about how, although he was not the smartest, um, biggest, or fastest, that he used every ounce of what he was given to his highest potential. He was physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight in the eyes of the father and the family. I am both honored and proud that a soldier from my district served with such courage and conviction. Nick embodied all the qualities of an ideal husband, son, brother, and friend, and I'd like to ask for unanimous Fire. consent for 30 more seconds. I cannot entertain that request. Ma'am? The chair cannot entertain that request. Okay. Well, first of all, I'll just go outside the rules. And let me say this. Nick, we miss you. And until we meet again in the presence of our Lord, I want to use a nice southern saying, Nick, you done good. Thank you, sir. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. DeFazio, for five minutes. This is a photograph from uh, 1956, uh, before we had a national transportation policy in the United States of America. And uh, if the Republicans are successful uh, with their budget and with their vision, this will be the future for the United States of America. There's a substantial number of Republicans on that side who've drunk the Kool-Aid of a guy named Grover Norquist, uh, who says he wants government so small he can strangle it in the bathtub. And we should devolve, devolve, this is interesting, not evolve, devolve transportation to the states. That is, that's right, our national transportation policy will be set by the 50 different states. Well, this is 1956, before we had a national transportation policy. This is the brand spanking new 
Kansas Turnpike. Isn't that beautiful? Well, look where it ends, in a farmer's field in Oklahoma, because Oklahoma chose not to build its section, which they had promised to build. That's the way things used to be, and that's the way they want things to be again. We're now on the precipice of basically walking away from investment in our nation's infrastructure. 150,000 bridges need replacement or repair in the national system. 40% of the pavement needs total replacement, not just an overlay. We have a $70 billion backlog in our 19th and 20th century transportation systems in our major urban areas, in our transit. And that's not even talking about building an efficient 21st century transportation system to deliver people and goods more efficiently. And what's their proposal? 31% cut in an already inadequate budget, or maybe no money at all. Actually, it's, it's, it's a bit odd. Mr. Ryan's uh, budget, uh, according to the Congressional Budget Office, uh, would not be enough to fund the uncontrollable outlays, i.e., projects already underway by the states for which the federal government has contracted to reimburse at the end of the construction of these projects, uh, his budget wouldn't even meet that number. And in terms of authorizing the bill, uh, they decided for the first time in history to make this a partisan issue. Dwight David Eisenhower, Republican president, he came up with the idea of a national transportation network. Ronald Reagan put transit into the Highway Trust Fund. They want to take out Ronald Reagan's step of putting transit in the Highway Trust Fund as an interim step before they do away with the program altogether. That's pretty extraordinary stuff. Their vision is that we will go back to this state of affairs in America. We cannot afford that. Next week, or the week after, the highway funding, temporary highway funding expires. The Senate has passed a bipartisan bill by an overwhelming majority. The Republican leadership has threatened their right-wing devolutionists do away with federal transportation by saying, we might make you vote on that Senate bill. That passes for a threat in the Republican caucus. We might make you vote on a good bill that would continue the current system with some improvements for a couple of years. That's a threat. That's what passes for a threat. Unless you vote for our crazy H.R. 7, which does away with transit funding and basically dismantles the program over a longer term, or the Ryan budget, which would immediately end the program next year. But they won't let us vote on that because they know a bunch of Democrats, just like in the Senate where Democrats and Republicans came together with an overwhelming majority and passed a transportation bill. They know that would happen here. So they got 80 or so you know, ultra-right-wingers who wouldn't vote for it. Big deal. I can match that with 150 Democrats, and we could have a bipartisan bill next week, putting millions of Americans back to work, rebuilding the crumbling infrastructure in this country. But instead, they want to devolve us back to a future. Smaller government. Smaller government. Yeah, that's great, guys. A transportation policy for the United States of America competing in a world economy set by the 50 states without funding. What a great vision. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Washington, Ms. McMorris-Rogers, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today on March 21st, a very special day, to celebrate the many contributions of those with Down syndrome, or also known as trisomy 21. Today, March 21st, has been officially designated by the United Nations as World Down Syndrome Day. And the date is significant in and of itself, because Down syndrome, the origins of Down syndrome and the underlying cause, is a duplicate 21st chromosome. We're all born with 23 pairs, an X and a Y. Those with Down syndrome have an extra 21st. Therefore, 3 in 21, and today is March 21st. The reason it's called Down syndrome is that these characteristics were discovered by a doctor by the name of Dr. Landon Down. He had a wonderful heart, a caring heart for those with disabilities, and therefore we call it Down syndrome today. Five years ago, my husband and I, Brian, gave birth to a beautiful baby little boy whose name is Cole, and he was born with that extra 21st chromosome. And Cole has given me a whole new perspective for being a mother and also being a member of Congress. Cole's birth has given me a whole new purpose for serving in Congress 
and he reminds me every day of the significance, the tremendous positive impact that every single person has on this world. And the fact that he has Down syndrome today only makes me more curious as to the impact he's going to have both on our lives and this world. He's an inspiration and he makes me a better person. Through Cole, I've been introduced and welcomed by the disabilities community, a wonderful group of people in America who every day also celebrate the tremendous impact and the potential of every life in this world. I find myself grateful to so many who've walked this path for more, before me and have improved the opportunities that Cole, as well as anyone with disabilities, is going to have. Today, there's there's greater opportunities through early intervention, education, advanced education, and lots of opportunities for independent living. However, there's so much more that needs to be done. And so today it's my turn to help carry the baton, to help work to unleash the potential of all those living with disabilities. I'm proud to co-chair the Congressional Down Syndrome Caucus with Representative Pete Sessions, Representative Steve Van Hollen, and Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton. And we are, we are committed to working on policies that are going to enhance the quality of life for those living with Down syndrome and other disabilities. And it's within the walls of Congress that we will do just that. We're working to pass legislation, hold briefings, and promote policies that will help those with Down syndrome all across the country. So today is World Down Syndrome Day. And a few minutes from now, at the United Nations headquarters, there's going to be a poem read. It's called Welcome to Holland. The author is Emily Pearl Kinsley. And I thought I wanted to read it to all of you today. Welcome to Holland. I'm often asked to describe the experience of raising a child with disability, to try to help people who have not shared that unique experience to understand it, to imagine how it would feel. It's like this. When you're going to have a baby, it's like planning a fabulous vacation trip to Italy. You buy a bunch of guidebooks and make your wonderful plans, the Colosseum, the Michelangelo David, the gondolas in Venice. You may learn some handy phrases in Italian. It's all very exciting. After months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives. You pack your bags and off you go. Several hours later, the plane lands. The stewardess comes in and says, Welcome to Holland. Holland, you say. What do you mean, Holland? I signed up for Italy. I'm supposed to be in Italy. All my life I've dreamed of going to Italy. But there's been a change in the flight plan. They've landed in Holland, and there you must stay. The important thing is that they haven't taken you to a horrible, disgusting, filthy place full of pestilence, famine, and disease. It's just a different place. So you must go out and buy new guidebooks, and you must learn a whole new language, and you will meet a whole new group of people you would have never met. It's just a different place. It's slower paced than Italy, less flashy than Italy. But after you've been there for a while, you catch your breath, you look around, and you begin to notice that Holland has windmills, and Holland has tulips, and Holland even has Rembrandts. But everyone you know is busy in going to Italy. And they're all bragging about the wonderful time they've had there. And for the rest of your life, you will say, yes, I was supposed to go. That's what I had planned. And the pain of that will never, never, ever go away. But the loss of that dream is a very significant loss. But if you spend your life mourning the fact that you didn't get to go to Italy, you may never be free to enjoy the very special, the very lovely things about Holland. Thank you. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. McGovern, for five minutes. Madam Speaker, uh, in about six weeks, the rainy season will begin in Sudan. Villagers will no longer be able to plant or harvest their crops. The roads will become impassable. It is the time of year when people live off their harvest, their orchards, and their land. But there is no food in the states of South Kordofan and Blue Nile inside Sudan. Not because of drought, not because locusts have destroyed the crops. No, Madam Speaker, this is a deliberate man-made catastrophe 
created by Sudanese President Bashir. For months, Khartoum has been launching rockets and dropping bombs on villages and fields throughout South Kordofan and Blue Nile. The people of the Nuba Mountains, primarily of black African descent, cannot work their fields for fear of being bombed. They hide in caves as bombers and helicopters fly overhead. Rockets bombard their villages. Sudanese soldiers march into their villages, killing, raping, setting fire to their homes, carrying out a scorched earth policy. The people of South Kordofan and the Blue Nile already are suffering from malnutrition and a severe shortage of food. Thousands are fleeing south, crossing into the newly independent nation of South Sudan, setting up refugee camps along the northern borders. Mainly women and children, they arrive traumatized, exhausted, and malnourished. President Bashir has denied humanitarian access to South Kordofan and Blue Nile for the delivery of desperately needed food aid. He wants no witnesses to, to his deliberate use of mass starvation as a weapon against his own people. And the clock is ticking, Madam Speaker, because the rainy season is coming, and then no one will be able to get food into these areas. But the bombs will continue to fall from the sky. Take a look at these photographs. The first one is a remarkable satellite image of villages being bombed in South Sudan. Uh, over here, you, uh, you see the Antonov bomber flying north back towards the Sudanese military air base. Right here, uh, you, uh, you see smoke plumes rising from civilian villages. Right here, fields and orchards being bombed. These are not military targets, Madam Speaker. There's not even a truck or a pickup that might be used for military purposes. All you see is villages, huts, orchards, and fields. Antonovs don't do precision bombing, Madam Speaker. They just open up the back bay of the airplane and roll out barrels of explosives. This is an image, Madam Speaker, of, in, of the indiscriminate bombing of civilians. This is a war crime. It took place on March 8th. And, um, and here, Madam Speaker, uh, are the targets of the bombs and rockets. Children, Madam Speaker, hiding and starving in caves. Uh, this photo uh, was taken by John Prendergast of the Enough Project and George Clooney, who were in South Kordofan on March 8th. They saw the planes and rockets striking villages. The satellite picture is, uh, is from the Satellite Sentinel project set up by Mr. Clooney and Digital Globe, which has donated millions of dollars of imagery from its satellites in an effort to provide an early warning system for human security in this region of Sudan. Last Friday, I stood on the steps of the Sudanese Embassy with George Clooney and my House colleagues, Congressman John Olver, Jim Moran, and Al Green. We were all arrested protesting the humanitarian crisis in Sudan. We were joined by George's father and journalist, Nick Clooney, John Prendergast of the Enough Project, our former colleague Tom Andrews, now with United to End Genocide, Martin Luther King III, Ben Jealous, the president of the NAACP, Nicole Lee, president of Trans-Africa Forum, Faye Williams, chair of the National Congress of Black Women, activist Dick Gregory, Rabbis David Saperstein and Steve Gateau, Fred Kramer with the Jewish World Watch, and Ian Schwab with the American Jewish World Service. We had a simple message. Let food and humanitarian aid reach the suffering people of South Kordofan and Blue Nile. Stop raping, killing, bombing, and starving innocent women, children, and men. I commend the Obama administration for pressuring Khartoum to let food reach these desperate people. But more must be done. I urge the President to engage China at the very highest levels to also demand unfettered access for humanitarian aid. Madam Speaker, the world must increase the pressure on President Bashir or watch another crime against humanity take place in Sudan. We must not be silent. I yield back my time. The chair recognizes the lady from California, Ms. Speer, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise again today to highlight the epidemic of rape and sexual assault in the military. This is the 17th time that I've stood here on the House floor to tell the story of a brave member of our military who has been raped or sexually assaulted by a fellow service member. Today I will tell you the story of Ellie Helmer, who served at the prestigious Marine Barracks in Washington, D.C. at 8th and I from 2005 to 2006. The Marines who serve here in Washington are known throughout the military as the tip of the sword. 
They perform ceremonial roles and participate in the silent drill platoon. They are the creme de la creme. You will notice that Ellie's story follows the exact same pattern as the dozens of stories I've told before and probably the same pattern of the estimated 19,000 rapes and sexual assaults that occurred in the military in 2010. This is the pattern of the epidemic. This is Ellie's story. The harassment started as soon as she arrived in Washington. Lieutenant Helmer was told that she was selected to be the public affairs officer for the barracks based on her appearance. She was told that command wanted a good-looking female officer to serve as a, quote, poster child. In addition to her role in public affairs, Lieutenant Helmer was also notified by mail that she was made a sexual assault and response coordinator. No one told her what the role required, and the only thing she knew about the position was that she'd be appointed to do it. In March of 2005, a captain continually commented on her appearance and began to harass her. He told Lieutenant Helmer that he picked her to be a public affairs officer because she was the prettiest. He made sexual advances, advances and kept sending her social emails. She spurned his advances and complained to the Marine Barracks Equal Opportunity Officer and provided copies of the emails and details about the harassment. The Marine Corps did nothing. The following year, the Marine Corps named Lieutenant Helmer to serve as the first female ceremonial parade flanking officer. Part of her responsibilities was to attend a pub crawl for St. Patrick's Day that had been endorsed by the colonel. When she objected to going, her superior, a major, told her it was a mandatory work event. The pub crawl involved a group of Marine officers identified in T-shirts going from bar to bar to bar on Capitol Hill, drinking excessive amounts of alcohol, all paid for by the Marine Corps. Lieutenant Helmer was required to drink shots at the same pace as the large male officers. On those occasions when she drank water to try and keep herself from becoming intoxicated, she was required by her boss to drink an extra shot as punishment. As a result of the forced consumption of alcohol that night, Lieutenant Helmer became very intoxicated and left to find a cab to go home. Her superior, the major, followed her out and told her that she needed to come with him to his office to discuss a business matter. When they reached his office, the Major tried to kiss her. Lieutenant Helmer resisted and the Major grabbed her, knocking her over and hitting her head against the wall. She lost consciousness at that point. When she awoke, she found herself lying on the floor in the Major's office, wearing his shorts. The Major was found naked from the waist down, passed out on the floor nearby. After Lieutenant Helmer left the Major's office, she reported it to her command that she had been raped. Her colonel discouraged her from asking for a rape kit examination, saying it would, quote, be out of his hands, unquote. In spite of the colonel's objections, Lieutenant Helmer sought and obtained a rape kit and medical examination. Despite the medical and circumstantial evidence of the rape, the Navy Criminal Investigative Services initially refused to investigate, claiming Lieutenant Helmer's inability to recall her rape precluded any investigation. After a delay that destroy, destroyed the crime scene, the NCIS eventually conducted a very brief investigation and concluded that nothing could be done in light of Lieutenant Helmer's lack of consciousness during the assault. In addition, the Marine Corps, quote, lost Helmer's rape kit. Lieutenant Helmer complained to the Major's superior, although that Marine officer admitted to the NCIS investigation was woefully inadequate, and removed the major from his command position. He refused to press charges or take any further steps to punish the rapist. Instead, he told Lieutenant Helmer, you're from Colorado, you're tough, you need to pick yourself up and dust yourself off. He then remarked, quote, I can't babysit you all the time. I yield back, yield back the, my time. The chair recognizes a gentleman from American Samoa, Mr. Falio Mavega for five minutes. Madam Speaker, to my colleagues here in this great chamber of the People's House, the House of Representatives, I know of no other place in the world 
only in America that a man whose father was a devout Muslim from Kenya, Africa, who was married to a white woman from the great state of Kansas, and with all due respect to our birth of friends, this man was born in the great state of Hawaii. This man is none other than Barack Hussein Obama, our president, Madam Speaker, our president of all of the United States of America and its territories. I want to share with my colleagues one of the most critical issues as advocated seriously by President Obama, and that is in the field of education. I commend President Obama for his commitment to providing every child in America access to a complete and competitive education all the way from cradle to career. In recent years, the United States has drastically fallen behind other countries when it comes to education. In the most recent program for International Student Assessment report published in 2009, researchers ranked the performance of 15-year-olds internationally and if I can get the page here, <laughs> found that the United States ranked 17th in reading, 24th in science, and 30th in math. To make America competitive once again, Madam, Pre uh, Madam Speaker, President Obama has introduced several key initiatives that focus on early childhood education, reform and invest in K-12 in education, and restore America's leadership in higher education. In his first major action of his presidency, President Obama signed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, which made significant investments in education. The act included $5 billion for early uh, learning programs as well as programs for children with special needs. The president also introduced accountability standards for the Head Start to ensure that early childhood programs are continued to deliver quality service. In addition, nine states have also received approximately $500 million from the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge Fund to create systems of high quality early learning and development programs. The President also got, set a goal for the United States to have the highest proportion of college graduates by the year 2020. To reach this goal, the President also focused on K-12 teaching and learning. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act provided $77 billion to strengthen elementary and secondary education including $48.6 billion to stabilize state education budgets and to encourage states to ensure that all schools have high qualify, highly qualified teachers, improve achievement in low-performing schools, and ensure college and career readiness. The President also has invested to make sure that teachers are supported as professionals in the classroom while also holding them more accountable. Effective teachers will be rewarded and states will be encouraged to remove ineffective teachers from the classroom. The president has also supported innovation in classroom, such as the expansion of high quality charter schools, investments in the race to the top competition between states, and also providing flexibility for states who are looking for greater relief under the No Child Left Behind Act. The president also introduced the Educate to Innovate campaign, which is almost to improve, which is also aimed to improve participation and performance of America's students in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. President Obama has also introduced measures to make college more affordable. Under the President's leadership, the maximum Pell Grant amount has been raised to $5,500. The new pay as you earn proposal will also give about 1.5 million students the ability to cap their loan payments at 10% of their monthly income and also allow debt forgiveness balance at 20 years of payments. The President also plans will enable an estimated 6 million students and receive college graduates to consolidate their loans and reduce their interest rates. Colleges and universities will also be rewarded based on their ability to offer relatively lower tuition costs and provide value to especially low-income students. Madam Speaker, if we prepare America's children with a high-quality education, we enable them to succeed in today's global economy. Furthermore, our ability to educate America's children will determine the economic competitiveness of our great nation. And as our President has recently stated, no issue will have a